Welcome everyone. My name is John Velasco. I am Senior Manager of Education and Training here at NHS. And it brings me such great pleasure to be part of this incredible conference that we offer every year and to be part of this incredible session that you are now joining with. I first would like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Santa Fe Genzyme, Takeda, CLS Bering, Genetech, Bayer, and Nova Nordisk. It is a pleasure to have the support as we keep moving on as a community. So thank you very much. Next slide, please. So as we begin, we want to make sure that you get the most out of this session. Um, and today we're gonna to be looking at the psychosocial impact of COVID, the social unrest, and also from the whole year that we've been going through or year and a half. So we want you to also be mindful that this session will be recorded. So we would like you for to please make sure that you remain as anonymous as possible, but also keep your name because there's gonna be an interactive component. So if you could please put your name and then a comma and then you know anything else that you want, you know whether you're a consumer or whatever, or just, just your first name. So really excited uh, to have this interactive component with everyone. Next slide, please. So a couple of things that we also want you to be mindful of is we have a chat feature here. So throughout the, throughout the session, you're gonna have a lot of questions. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat and our amazing colleague, Nick, who is our chat manager, who I'm so grateful for, will be managing the chat and we will get to as many questions as possible. Throughout the, throughout the session, we'll have that opportunity to have that interactive part. We are also having a poll, uh, which I just love polls, right? It gives us an opportunity to really to connect with one another. So Nick will also be putting in that poll link for you, but don't worry, in one of our PowerPoint slides, there'll be a QR code that just get your phone ready. So get your phone ready. This is one of those sessions that we want you to get your phone ready. And you'll be using that QR code to have that interactive part of it. And our speakers will definitely be explaining a little bit more of this to you all. All right, next slide. So it is such a pleasure and a joy. We have been on this journey on putting this session together for over three months. And I have not worked with such better group of folks in my entire life. So it, it brings me such great pleasure to work with Sandra Valeros Herrera, who I've been working now with a couple of years, who is not only intelligent, but has great heart and compassion and has her has her finger on the pulse of the community. So really excited for her to bring her, you know, her theories and her compassion to this presentation. We also have Raymond Lamb and welcome Raymond Lamb. This is your first BDC session. So really excited that you're gonna be presenting and also bringing the wealth of knowledge that you have. And then of course, the one and only John M who has been such a pleasure to work with as well. And two, he also is, this is his first BDC. So please, BDC, please, Bleeding Disorders community, welcome these amazing speakers with your heart and your love. And also on a little side note, a little belated happy birthday to Sandra and to John. So happy birthday, 25 never looked so good. So John, it's all yours. I love that, 25, thank you so much, John. <laughs> So again, welcome everyone to the psychosocial impact of COVID-19 and social unrest. It's so good to meet you all virtually. I wish I could have met you in person, but perhaps for a different year. Um, now, because it's a mental health workshop, we really just wanna make sure that you're taking as many steps as possible to, to, to take care of yourselves. So what that looks like is listening to your body. If you have any type of needs, for example, if you need to get some water, if you need to stretch, if you need to step away, if the content gets a little heavier than you expected, we support you, whatever you feel like you need to do today. Uh, and just a reminder, because of the amount of people that are with us today, we won't be able to respond to every chat message or question, but we're gonna try our absolute best. And keep in mind that we do have a Q&A portion at the very end, where we'll try to answer any unanswered questions and take any feedback as well. Hello everyone, thank you again for being here. So excited to be with all of you. Um, my name is Sandra Valdovino Seredia. I am a licensed clinical social worker, therapist as well. 
Um, a little bit about myself. My pronouns are she, her, hers, as you see up here. Um, and I want to share two things. We want to share two things with you. Um, one of them is what brings us joy. What brings me joy is being out in nature. Um, and what makes me feel vulnerable. Um, one of those things that makes me feel vulnerable sometimes is sharing a little bit about myself with someone that I don't know. Thank you. And uh, my name is Raymond Lamb. Um, a pleasure to be here with everybody today. My first time doing this um, and anything this virtual. So um, it's that is a little bit of vulnerability. I'll start with that. Um, any new beginning um, for me at times, any new transitions um, create feelings of hopes and fears. Um, I also just want to say that somebody once said to me, being vulnerable is such an opportunity for growth. And um, I just wanted to share that with you and something to remember. Um, what brings me joy, um, friends, family, being with them and during this COVID, um, social quarantine, isolation, my dog Marco has brought me so much joy. I just wanted to say that. Um, also the pronouns that I use are he, him, and his. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the um, city of Los Angeles, and I'm also a psychotherapist. And i um, looking forward to um, getting to know you and sharing this with you. Thank you. We have such a great group, everyone. Um, my name is John M. I am a therapist. Um, my preferred gender pronouns are he, him, his. And what brings me joy, this actually happened this morning, so I have to share with you. <laughs> Waking up before my alarm goes off and seeing I have an hour left brings me joy, everyone. Um, and what makes me feel vulnerable actually is asking for help. Um, asking for help puts me in a very vulnerable position. Um, and even saying that out loud makes me feel very vulnerable. So thank you all. Um, so now we want to start off by um, just pointing out that, you know, first of all, thank you for being here. You know, you have the option of um, other sessions. You're not attuning to the session today. So I um, want to highlight that you probably, when you saw the description um, of today's session, you saw words like COVID-19, social unrest, isolation, anxiety, resiliency. That's a lot. <laughs> um, it's pretty loaded. And so what we wanted to do first before we dive deep into this uh, session is to help guide you through our slide deck. So as you can see here on the slide, we've broken down our presentation by in three um, parts. So the very first part is called self-reflection. So this is where we talk about becoming and the importance of becoming more aware of what we're actually thinking and feeling. Um, after that, we'll go into how it works. That's the second part. Um, and this is where we'll go dive deep, even deeper and talk about the evidence and theory, the mechanics behind, um, uh, behind mental health, mental wellness. Um, and this is useful for someone who's just trying to understand more deeply or someone who just wants to know more. Um, and lastly, we're going to get into in my life. In that section, um, we're going to really talk more about um, things that you can do, actionable things. Um, what are the things that, um, that we actually take away and use in our lives to make an impact? Um, so that's exactly what we're going to discuss. Um, and like John mentioned, we'll have opportunity at the end, if you have any questions, uh, to explore your thoughts a little bit more. Now Raymond's going to talk a little bit about culture and how we are weaving that into our session. Yes, um, thank you, Sandra. And um, for this, um, it's so important, I really believe, to uh, get the degree of how important that culture is. Um, it's critical for us to mention that because um, culture, they say, and this is what I heard once, that culture influences and dictates our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. And that's pretty big when you break that down. So that, yeah, 
but right, thank you. So that's what it influences. It's the lens they say in which how we see and respond to our daily lives. So that is big. Also, I just wanted to add, so where does culture come from? Um, comes from different places, comes from family, comes from religion, comes from society, comes from neighborhood, et cetera. And all of that influences how we think, how we feel, and how we behave. Um, and now maybe, let me give you an example. Um, so in my, with me growing up in my culture, um, with men, feelings weren't really talked about. Um, growing up, I really didn't get a lot of um, role models um, in the sense of expressing their feelings and talking about them. And definitely uh, therapy was not even on the table. Just wanted to say that. Um, so um, I want everybody maybe to begin to think about again, how culture has influenced them. Um, and maybe Sandra, you could talk about how um, something about your culture and its influences. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, um, so one of my identity, identities is um, I'm, you know, Latina, Mexican. And so growing up in my family and my culture, growing up in Mexico, and even once we came to the United States is we don't talk about emotions <laughs> um, or, you know, or, or the words that would describe how you feel. That wasn't something that I learned growing up. And for me, I grew up in a very traditional Korean household where the words I love you never came up, never came out at all. Um, but I will say this is a pretty nice determining factor too. Acts of service and serving food and sharing food was an incredible way that my parents showed their love. Um, very different than normal ways or not normal Western ways of kind of conveying love in different ways. So um, really good to keep in mind of that culture piece as well. Thank you. And so as we continue onward, again, um, try, as we say, to self-reflect and keep in mind how culture maybe affects how you think, feel, and respond to the thoughts and ideas in this presentation um, that we're presenting. And now John is going to talk about setting expectations. Right. Now, because we only have about 90 minutes, maybe more like 75 now, I wanted to get this session started off right and get a feel for all the different types of perspectives uh, and opinions that we have in the room today. Um, and what this is gonna help us do is guide some of the discussion and some of the explanations that we'll provide today in a way that's much more useful for you all. So what we're gonna do, so this is gonna be an interactive activity. Um, we're gonna guide you through it. If, if tech is not your thing, we let us know in the chat and we will support you. The question that we want to have answered today with, it could be one word, it could be two words. What two to three words describe what you hope to get from this plenary session? And so responses could be, and so I'll, we'll put up the link in just a minute. I see it already inside of the chat, but it could be things like connection. It could be things like knowledge. It could be like support. Um, whatever words come to mind, go ahead and put that in there. Sandra, if you could take us to the next slide, please. So what's really cool about this activity, as you start to input your words, we will start to see a word cloud form, which is very exciting for all of us. Um, no problem, Nick. I appreciate uh, putting it in there early. Um, and so we'll start to see. Okay, great. So we have some folks putting perspective in your thank you. L. Daniel, um, we will just wait for some of these responses to come in. Um, but some, just off the top of my head, um, some of you may be curious about, you know, what mental health has to do with the bleeding disorder community. That's a great thing to kind of put in there. Questions could be the word that you put in. Um, understanding mental well-being. That's a huge one, right? clear picture. Thank you, Melissa, for, for putting that in there as well. I think we, for, uh, for me, I'll speak for myself. I've been on this earth for 33 years, and I still don't always know what's going on in my brain. 
<laughs> and what I need to be more well, right? What will our future be, Priscilla? Thank you so much. Um, so I think there might be actually a little bit of an issue with our poll everywhere. So thank you everyone for inputting. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit. If you could pop in your wording and words into the chat itself, we can, um, we can go ahead and read those off and share how people are feeling. So we have a lot of things uh, people are feeling, pretty widespread, but I think people just want clarity, right? Clarity of the present, clarity of the future, right? Preventative measure, measures I see here to improving. So we're, this is great. We're gonna see all of this in our presentation today. There are Something more that I want to point out as well yeah. um, mm -hmm. is for the audience or if you're new to poll, congratulations, I commend you. <laughs> um, but if not, this is moving forward. Know that this is uh, a way for us as a community to understand how we're feeling, where our headspace is. So if you see the word support, for example, here, that means that um, more than several people actually um, included this word here. So the, the bigger the font, the more the people are inputting this, um, these words in. So um, it gives us a sense also of, I'm not the only one who's thinking about perspective or support. There are other people as well. Right. And I just, and, and what's resonating with me right now, I just wanted to say that, um, somebody wrote isolation makes it hard to compare my experience to others. And that is, I, that is so true. And I'm hoping that from this experience is going to give you the connection, the beginning of a connection to help get that comparison and to help connect. So thank you so much for that. And also somebody said, I cannot see the results. We're actually in the chat right now. And that's how I'm seeing them for that person. Okay, thank you. And yeah, so Sarah, thank you for, so much for that feedback. We have a little bit of technical difficulty. So our, our we had this really cool idea, right? So as yeah. <laughs> our respondents were putting in the results, a word cloud was supposed to form in the middle and be a beautiful, like a picturesque, representation mm. of how everyone was feeling. But you know what? We appreciate that everyone has been putting in results and responses into the chat. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna give a couple more minutes for folks to pop in anything else that might that they might want addressed today or directions they'd like the session to go in. And after that, we will move forward. Yeah. But thank you so much, Raymond, for pointing those things out. It's really sure. important for people to feel connected, at least through this session, not only yes. to us and to mental health, but to others right. in the bleeding community, bleeding disorders that, community that are struggling yes. with mental health or yeah. just feel off and not quite sure if it's a mental health thing or not. That's totally possible right. too. And we recognize that. Ooh, Natalia. Natalia put in <laughs> ways to be resilient. Yes. Did you see the slide deck? <laughs> that's a, that's a, right. That's an amazing word, resilience, and we'll talk more about yes. that today. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, this chat is going to stay open, so if things come up for you, please feel free to pop in questions. We are here for you. We are supportive of you. Um, we are going to move forward now that we have a little bit better of an idea of where people are at. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. This is our, our uh, first start. We're gonna start with the self-reflection section of the presentation. Um, so this is again, where we wanna take an opportunity to explore how, how you are feeling and those around you are feeling and thinking. Um, and as John mentioned previously, you know, this may bring up some emotions for you, some uncomfortable, um, you know, feelings for some of, some of you. So know also your limits, know it, that it's okay to step away or if you see um, somebody's camera go off, that's okay as well. <laughs> Um, and also, um, you know, making sure that um, you're taking this as an opportunity for, for self-care. Why not? <laughs> so yeah. this is the question that we um, want you to think about. How has your overall well-being been affected by the past year? 
Okay, so we just want you to take two minutes to, or a minute, <laughs> to think about, um, and if you have a paper and a pencil, write this down, whatever comes up for you, or if you'd like to share in the chat, please go ahead and do that. So we're just gonna take a minute to think about what this means for you and your experience and those around you. And so while this was designed as more of a personal self-reflective internal activity, if you do feel compelled to share in the chat, we want to foster that community as well. So please feel free to pop, pop that in there and we'll, we, will, we will build community with you and hold that space with you all. So already right off the bat, we see Melissa saying that yeah. she's definitely feeling more stressful. Absolutely. Right. People are feeling more confused and uncertain. I totally get that. And fun fact, even therapists feel these things. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Okay. So thank you all for, again, for being vulnerable. This is part of it, even though we're in this virtual platform, that you're sharing your feelings and your thoughts with others. Um, and for some of us, that can also feel good, like not feeling so alone. Okay, somebody else feels this way. So thank you again for, for participating and sharing. And I just wanted to add that um, a few times the future has come up, the uncertainty surrounding that and the anxieties. And we are in, a, we have never been here before with everything that's going on. We are such in a new place, this planet where we are. And somebody once said to me, when something is so new, somebody said, Raymond, what are your reference points? Well, in this, we really don't have much. It's, we're doing it step by step. And that makes it hard. And also, who are your role models? What are your reference points? Who are your role models when something is new? And we are so much in the unknown right now with so much going on. So uh, again, um, we're not, a, no, nobody's exempt, right? I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So continuing with our self-reflection, um, we now have this question for, for all of you to think about. How are you feeling now? So as you think about this, as you, as you notice, we're asking you to think about your feeling. Um, so this, this is something you can do on your own, you know, outside of this session. Um, with and this could be anything from with where our country is with the pandemic you know um for some of us is having our children going back to school in person and i'm in southern california um you know for some it might be experiencing challenges as some of you have indicated in the chat um what is it like right um, living with a chronic bleeding disorder um, during a pandemic and going to the hospital, waiting in the waiting room. I mean, you know, what has this uh, been feeling like, not just right now, but for you? These are some questions to, to ponder on. So feel free if you would like to share your thoughts or um, in the chat. Um, but again, these are um, questions that you could ask yourself or, or if you are someone like a caretaker that you can um, help your child or adolescent or partner <laughs> with to explore further. How are you feeling? See that Priscilla added um, a longer post and appreciate you so much for sharing that with us. That yeah. year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, right, right, yeah. And so now we're gonna move into the next session, of uh, section of the session. John so is gonna- real, real quickly though, I see it. 
I, I forgive me for mispronouncing. I know I'm going to mispronounce it. Lehua uh, put in a question. So what we're going to do, we have someone taking a look at all of our questions, um, and we're going to try and answer them at the end here. Um, okay. But thank you. I think that's a really good question. You can address that, and you, you make it answered as we go through the session too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So on the coattails of all of this amazing sharing, there is a lot of heaviness, right? You all are dealing with so much whether as a provider, whether as someone who deals with a bleeding disorder yourself or a family member or a loved one, it's difficult. That's to say the least, right? So we're gonna take a moment. We're gonna take a mindful moment here to regulate ourselves, to get us to a good place so we can start taking in this information that we wanna share with you all, okay? So, um, and this is perfect. Your cameras are off, so I can't see you. So relax in whatever way, shape or form makes you feel the most comfortable. I usually suggest sitting down, um, kind of back to your chair, letting your shoulders drop down and closing your eyes if you can. And just start breathing. So typical form, you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. You breathe in through your nose or through your mouth or difficult. You can feel free to breathe however you like, whatever is most comfortable for you. But just feel yourself slowing down your breathing. Take a breath in and take a breath out. Take a deep breath in and a breath out. And I want you to imagine Every time you breathe in, you bring all you breathe in all those good memories, those loved ones. And as you breathe out, you breathe out any of that doubt, that feeling of isolation, that feeling of sadness, stress, anger, maybe even. Let it go just for this session. And keep breathing in and out and start to feel things soften and relax. All right, when you're ready, go ahead and take your final breath and open your eyes and return back to the room. Thank you for having a mindful moment with me. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you guys for that. Um, yeah. You're gonna move along, but this is, again, this is uh, something that you could use with John just um, guided us through something that you can do on your own, whether you're in your car, whether you're at home, standing in line to get groceries. Um, you know, this is a, a practice that you can do for yourself. And again, if you're a caretaker, you can teach your children, adolescents. Um, it's, it's really important. Um, so what we want to do first is um, talk a little bit about what is mental health, right? When we think about mental health, there are many thoughts that come to mind. Um, so the way that we would want to simplify it in a way and, and honoring the time that we have available with you um, in a way where we're capturing the spectrum of mental health. And so what we have here is um, stick figure <laughs> with an umbrella. And um, we want you to think about mental health in terms of a spectrum, right? Mental health, wellness, distress, illness. Um, and what we have here is um, someone, it could be you or somebody that you are thinking of holding an umbrella, that's your foundation. And everything that happens around us, around you, around your family, um, it impacts you. So we have big drops and small drops and lightning. We didn't put in the tornado, but that can happen as well. So the small drops could indicate, and these are just examples, so feel free to fill in as I'm talking about this, um, could be um, anything from feeling anxious right now, sweaty palms, 
um, maybe shortness of breath um, in the future, maybe you've in the past you've experienced this um, sadness, frustration, worry. Um, the big drops could indicate anything like depression, clinical depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use, uh, grief and loss. We also have trauma and medical trauma here as lightning. Um, and we'll get more into what the umbrella signifies, but we wanted to start with this image of um, what it may feel like for some of us who are experiencing mental health distress um, during COVID, during the pandemic, um, during times of social unrest. So again, this, these are just some examples, but we wanted to start off by just giving you, you know, a place to start. And mental health, you know, mental health itself, the word, has a lot of connotations, right? People, sometimes some people can think positively about it. Like I, for myself, think very positively about mental health. But if you were to ask my family members, mainly my dad, <laughs> what mental health is or like how he feels about it, he wouldn't even look at me. He'd be like, what are you talking about? That's not a thing. We don't talk about that. You're, he's, he's, still, he's still coming to terms with our therapist. Um, but you know, there's a lot of connotations and sometimes we can take those messages inwards right, and feel badly about even thinking about mental health. If that's not something that you talk about in your family. But what this is basically helping us see is that mental health is a doorway for us to look at ourselves and figure out how we feel and you know, how we might wanna make ourselves feel better. Someone mentioned very early on well-being as being part of something that they were looking forward to understanding more about. And that's part of mental health. In very simple terms, in my perspective, that's mental health, that concern, that thought that you're putting into this. Um, and just to piggyback on what I'm sorry, to piggyback on what you said, John, is that unfortunately, and I and I'm hoping this is breaking, I'm a strong a strong advocate for mental health is the shame and stigma that surrounds it at times. Um, and again, depending on the culture, as you stated, of where we come from, if somebody had a broken arm and their arm was in a cast, that would be all right. But as we're gonna talk about, sometimes these things, the trauma, these droplets, they have an opportunity to at times break us and shatter us a little bit and we need to heal. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. Thank you, John. I think that's a real critical piece. Right. So Sandra, if we go, go ahead, Raymond, sorry. I, I was just gonna um, pass it to Sandra, thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sandra, did you have anything else for this one or can we go into the next one? Um, I think it's good to go to the next one um, since right. we're talking about what can happen so, in that phrase. Yes. So Sandra mentioned the panels of the umbrella as being important, right? And so you can imagine the panels of this umbrella. I hope you all can see it. If not, I will read some of this um, out to you all. Um, this, these panels are different things. Uh, we call them protective factors or coping skills. But what they really are, they could be time with your family. They could be time with friends, knowing that your friends are there. It could be breathing, it could be meditation. It could be your own faith and spirituality. So these are all things that are grounding you, that are keeping you, for lack of very, keeping you sane, right? Keeping you above, um, your head above the water when things are horrible when things just feel unmanageable these things are what bring you back and make you think wow okay i can do this i can absolutely do this right, right. and it could even be exercises i will share with you um actually let me explain this one thing and then i'll explain my little story um what gets us into trouble though right what gets us into trouble is when we start to have tears in that protective layer. And this can happen anyway, and it's to no fault of anybody. And I'll give you an, a brief example of my own life and how these tears have formed over this past year for me. Um, I used to exercise 
a lot, like four to five times a week, weightlifting, right? Um, when the pandemic started, gyms closed. No more access to that. That was my coping skill. What do I do? I didn't even really realize the effect right, of what I was just like, okay, I'm not working out. I'll find a different way. But because it was such a major part of my coping skills and what was protecting me um, as an intensive services therapist, I really started to feel it six months, six months in and even a year in. And I usually meditate. I wasn't even doing that because full disclosure, I was dealing with roommates that actually had COVID. So it was a, it was a mess at my house. So I can only imagine with the added stress of someone or yourself dealing with a bleeding disorder, having to deal with all of this and having a coping skill disappear or, or a grounding element of your life, right? And that's, that's incredibly difficult. And you would, you, and so as these stressors, as Sandra was explaining, these big droplets above the umbrella, as those droplets start to go through those rips and tears, you feel them and you feel that weight. You feel that weight on you or that stress or whatever, however it comes up for you in your body. And so it's really important to not lose hope though. I think it's easy to go down that route and think like, oh my God, John's telling me that there are tears. There are absolutely tears in my umbrella right now. What am I gonna do, right? And then we're gonna go to the next slide where we talk about, talk about the repair, the repair. And this may be a Western thing, I'm not sure, but a lot of folks think that if you fix it, it's not as good. It's not as good if you fix it. I think that's just kind of, if it's, fit, if it's broken, buy a new one, right? It's kind of the mentality nowadays. I do wanna share with you, there's this beautiful art making technique um, from Japan and it's called Kintsugi. And basically what it is, so these artisans start to see cracks in their pottery. They were like, oh, there's gotta be a way, right? We didn't have to just fix this. They literally took gold and gold leaf to fill the cracks to make it even stronger than before and more beautiful. And the whole appeal of this art making technique is that there people expect there to be cracks and then cracks filled with gold. Wild, wild to me. And so if you think of that, and so this in a very similar way for thinking about remodeled bone, right? let's say you break your leg or break a wrist or anything. Some of you may know that that bone sometimes grows back even stronger in, in a very standard case, right? I know that there are exceptions, of course. But just taking that into account, that if we can repair the tears in our umbrella, the tears in our protective layers, maybe there's a way forward, right? Maybe there's a way forward. And the way that we do that is through that awareness of figuring out, ah, okay, that's gone. Or maybe a family dynamic has changed and you can't lean on someone quite as much. Being able to recognize and see like, okay, so I don't have him to support me anymore. Maybe there's someone else in my life that I can lean on and very intentionally bring that person in. Right? Or maybe if I can't exercise in the same way, I can look for a different type of exercise that might work with the type of exercise that I can do, right? Very, and so all of this is just tapping into your own awareness of what's happening, how things feel, and repairing those in different ways. And the repair is very general here, but we can talk about what that looks like and we talk about building coping skills in the future of this uh, deck here. And I would also like to add that uh, we intentionally left the drops and the lightning and the tornadoes that you don't see <laughs> because even with all this coping, life still happens, you know, curveballs still come and go. And so, um, you know, and sometimes, I mean, we see the image here on the screen where the, you know, the stick figure is holding the umbrella. Sometimes we just want to like take it off, <laughs> you know, so it, you know, this is, this is an example, but again, we, we wanted to bring this up for you as an awareness, like John just mentioned, that this happens to all of us, no matter your age, 
right? Children, older adults, <laughs> um, wherever you are in life, whether you're tuning in from the United States right now or outside of the US and from other countries, um, this is a human emotional experience. Um, and so we wanna normalize that for, for, for all of us. And, and if this is new for you to hear this, please, um, know that this is, if you're a human being, most likely <laughs> you have experienced all of it or some of it, depending on where you are in your life as well. And I just also want to add that um, we're going to talk about it um, a little bit later, but also the repair, even though it's, it is arduous, it feels difficult, it is difficult, what it gives us. I'm just going to go back to what somebody said, resilience. The repair could give us resiliency, it does. It increases our self-esteem. It gives us mastery over situations, confidence. There is so much that's here. This is all, as Sandra was saying, part of our humanity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. So real quickly, before we go into that next slide, I wanna address some of these questions in a way that might be connected to what we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, Lekwa asked this question of her lovely 11 year old about staying positive um, when having possible close contact with COVID and that could be incredibly difficult. But just thinking about this, right, the umbrella references here, um, being aware and helping your, um, your 11 year old stay aware and recognizing this is hard. I know you want to be in school with the other kids. Why would you want to be home? You must be angry. So calling it out. Calling it out and having that discussion, allowing your 11 year old to share that, but also understanding that maybe there are coping skills that your little one has, or you have together, whether it's perhaps maybe baking is something that brings you all joy, or maybe reading a book together brings you all joy. Finding those things that make the difficult, not so difficult, right? Even something as small as that um, and coupling that with just being aware and being able to talk or even play, I think that could be very helpful in that scenario. And I see a lot of other ones here too. I can't get to all of them, but we're gonna try our right. best. Thank you. I see Greg, I see, I see Andrea here. Um, a lot of folks, thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. And we're going to move it along. I know I wish we had like a whole day or three days, <laughs> um, but we're going to move you through the next step, which Raymond's going to take us through, which is uh, trauma. Yes. Um, and, and before I define what is trauma, I just want to um, preface with this. This is what Dr. Cosolino said, and I really appreciate it, appreciated it. So, and do appreciate that the existence of trauma has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis with an open mind and with an open heart. We are all individuals. And also, I just wanted to say, we are not here to make a diagnosis. And I don't, did Sandra, did you wanna to add to that or it's up Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. Okay. So um, not all trauma, right? Causes a like clinical uh, psychological disorder. Right? There's, there's a book that we use as practitioners, as a psychotherapist, where you have to meet certain criteria, you know, and I know that in colloquial speaking, we throw out these, um, these words like depression, she's depressed, she's, you know, she's bipolar, we're not here to do that. <laughs> um, you know, some psychological disorders do result from trauma, like post-traumatic stress disorder, disorder, other known as PTSD. Um, clinical, you know, major depressive disorder, dissociative disorder, but these are specific diagnoses, again, that require specific criteria of symptoms, um, and we're not here to diagnose, and not, again, not because just because we are all experiencing, for example, a pandemic, doesn't mean that we're all going to experience it the same way, or that it will manifest the same way, so we just want to be mindful of that. Thank you, thank you. And um, John, I, I wanna thank you. Uh, John made this slide and I really appreciate it. 
Um, I love the people holding each other. I love the connection. When we were talking about isolation a little while ago, this is the opposite of isolation. Um, and we're holding each other. And somebody once said to me that, um, think of us as beautiful stained glass windows. And this is a stained glass window. And what happens is trauma comes in and it hits this window. And, and as it hits this window, a result of it could be is that pieces of the window, pieces of us get shattered. We could maybe even broken. This is what trauma can do. It could fragment us. And that can cause a rupture in how we see ourselves, how we see others. And what I'm hearing people also in the chat say, how we see the world right now. What is going on? The fear and the anxieties that are surrounding that. So how we think and how we feel can become distorted. It doesn't feel right. Almost like, oh my God, what happened to my foundation? I thought I was standing on something and now that it's gone. And when this happens to us, everything that I just stated, this directly affects our mental health and well being. And the definition of trauma that we are going to um, use today is, and this is going to be the next slide now the definition of trauma. And John, can you read this for us? Absolutely. And right before we do that, in case you all didn't notice, we love metaphors. So we have stained glass, <laughs> but we also have the umbrella, very similar examples of just illustrating for you all what can happen when things like trauma or stressors tear apart or shatter what we've built for ourselves. It, it's just right. like it happens. Right. right? And our it's psyche amazing. is equally as important as our biological body. And we're talking about what happens to our psyche, our mind, our thoughts, our feelings right now. Thank you. All right, let me, let me put on my reading voice here. Um, okay. Definition <laughs> of trauma. Trauma is the response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event or events that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope, causes feelings of helplessness, diminishes their sense of self and their ability to feel a range of emotions and experiences. Thank you, John. And when I saw this, I went, oh my gosh, this is so exactly to what many of us, if not all of us are experiencing today. Trauma given, as they said, the deeply distressing and disturbing events of our world, the global pandemic, social and political and economic unrest in the world, living with chronic medical conditions and even our own mental health. Our lives have become disrupted. And the question is, how has your life been disrupted? That's a big question. And from that disruption, how and what are you feeling? For many of us, there has been a lot of losses. There's been a lot of grief. There's a lot of grieving that's going on right now. And, and, and the grief is the physical losses of our loved ones. And it's also the symbolic losses of what we used to know, what was once familiar is no longer familiar. And so trauma then with that said, directly affects our brain. And that directly affects our thoughts and feelings. And it's important, and I, and I wanna elaborate on that. And so um, what's important to know is that the trauma, everything that we're talking about affects us. And I wanna talk about now how it affects the brain. And that's the next slide, please. So with this, this is right here. This is how, um, this is a brilliant picture of a small picture of our brain, some components of our brilliant brain. And today we're gonna to focus on the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And um, I think Sandra just wants to another analogy maybe. <laughs> yes, so um, before Raymond dives deep into um, how our brain works, um, I just wanna use another metaphor <laughs> or an analogy. <laughs> Um, so the amygdala, you can see right here in the, in the center of this brain, colored in purple, um, you can think about it as a walnut shape 
or like a walnut or a smoke detector. Okay, so a smoke detector goes off when something happens like smoke. <laughs> it does not differentiate whether it's smoke coming from a burnt um, bagel in the toaster or there's an actual fire in an apartment. It just goes off, right? So that is the purpose of the smoke detector. So just keep that in mind as a reference as you're hearing Raymond um, explain a little bit more about um, the the brain the our, our wonderful brains okay right and now i'm going to go into um i, I want to go into a little bit deeper um what sandra just said and i want to talk about the neurobiological consequences of stress and trauma and that's going to be um on the next slide thank you so the next slide here um, um when you see this and the amazing thing is we have over the past 15 years, because of the advent of the MRIs, the CAT scans, et cetera, the neurobiology field has really exploded in psychology. We get such a better understanding. I have to say so many of the concepts of what Freud was talking about is like, oh my gosh, they're, <laughs> they're here. And now there's evidence to this. So the green slide here is if you look on top is on stress. This is when the brain is on stress. And it talks about the prefrontal cortex here. And um, Sandra, what does that say underneath that? Yeah. So if you are, if we're experiencing, if we're not stressed, right? Yeah. If that's the green image here of the, the, the green colored brain. Um, that means that we have some control of our thoughts, the ability, the space, the headspace to think, to use the, this part of the brain, the front part, and then also for our emotions or not, our actions. What you see on the other side is the the red colored brain. That's when we're all under when we're under stress. If you're a human being and you're stressed, <laughs> this is what it would look like, um, which means that we have a less control or weaker control of our thoughts, um, our emotions and our actions. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to piggyback on that is that um, the prefrontal cortex, they also call that, that's our executive functioning, um, a big word, but our executive functioning, that part of our brain really fully does not get developed. Studies have come out because of the MRIs, maybe 23, 24, 25, 26. But this executive functioning, what it gives us is um, decision-making processes, our, how, how we make a decision, our judgment, our memory, our impulse control, our processing. This is pretty big, okay? This really helps us with clarity, with balance. And then what happens is, as you could see, under stress, the weaker control of thoughts, emotions, the prefrontal cortex then gets overtaken by the amygdala. And the amygdala, if you can see on the red slide, that is the most primitive part of our brain. That's developed, let's say, by the time we are eight months. And this is our survival instinct. If you heard of the fight, flight, freeze response, that's the amygdala. And, what, and it's designed for survival, like I said. And what happens, though, under stress, simply the amygdala gets activated. So when we're stressed, when we have trauma, everything that we're talking about, the amygdala gets activated, produces a hormone called cortisol. The cortisol, when it gets too high, it overwhelms our central nervous system and the executive functioning then goes offline. The amygdala turns off the executive functioning. So what does that mean? What happens? Everything I just stated a little while ago, our ability for judgment, our ability for memory, our ability to make a clear decision, our impulse control, all of these things get shut off a matter of degrees. And then we begin to feel anxious. We begin to feel scared. And it's really hard to navigate, navigate all of this. And what happens with that process is a lot, as you could imagine, the feelings that we are talking about. So the question then is, because this is how it works, how do we come back online? How do we kind of turn that amygdala 
off, lower the volume a little bit so we could kick in that prefrontal cortex. And how we do that is the next slide coming up now is we're going to do that Real through. Quickly, though. Yes. Real quickly, though, I want to address John's comment here. He said, I wonder what it's like when in between. Such a good comment, right? And I think that I can explain this through uh, one of my kid clients, right? And what we do when my little kid clients, my little eight-year-old, and he's trying to figure out how to calm down when he, when his little amygdala goes off and his prefrontal cortex goes off, right? And so normal, normally our awareness is just not built in a way where we know the in-between. It's we're triggered or we're not. We're triggered or we're not, right? And so what you try to figure out with these young ones and even us too, building that awareness to the point where now the little guy, he says, Mr. John, Mr. John, I think I need a break, right? His awareness is built to a point where he can, he can start to feel the rumblings of the cortisol, the, the, the heat building in his body, the physical symptoms, and he can, he can verbalize and say, I need a break, or can we do some deep breathing? And so that's what the in-between looks like, the, that, that like building of that, whether it be anxiety or you can start to feel yourself go out of control just a little bit. That's what that middle portion might feel like but it would take a little bit of work of awareness to feel that, that portion. Help that yeah. helps, John. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, John. And that's a lot of work to be able to have that self-awareness when we're under that much stress and the amygdala is kicked up that high. And thank you for that, especially for little kids. And um, part of that, how we do that is through breathing, through meditation, through lowering that down. Breath is so underrated, I have to tell you. Um, think about, um, I mean, the times that we're living in, the world that we're living in, I'm living in LA, the freeways, et cetera, mask, no mask, all of this. I mean, how many times am I walking just holding my breath tightness that's in here and we're not even aware of that? Um, so I want to try to bring breath into a more mindful place, which John is going to talk about. So it's through the breathing, it's through meditation, it's through that pause. Pause is amazing. There's so much strength when we pause and we live in a world that keeps us going. Stress keeps us going. Trauma keeps us going. Look at Forrest Gump if you saw that movie after Vietnam. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run across the country. Gotta keep moving, can't keep still. Trauma does not, all of this keeps us moving. Let me say that. And that's why I love this quote here on the next slide. The next slide says, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. At times, my gosh, that's a superpower. That could actually be a superpower. And stress and, str and trauma, when we, are, when we are offline, when the amygdala is fired, when we're stressed, when we're anxious, that gets hard to do. So it's back to the breathing, the meditation, the pause. This is all going to help us. And when John was talking about kids um, or, or um, the children, I should say, the same as adults, when we are up here, when we're up here, there's not a lot that could be done until we get down here. It's bringing us back. And now John is gonna talk a little bit more about the breathing and its benefits to add and elaborate on that. Thank you. My favorite, breathing, right? So <laughs> underrated, so underrated. Um, you know, it's really important to realize, and we've been talking about this for a minute now, how increases, increase, how breathing and just pausing gives space in our day to be more aware whether that's things coming out of some other people from, from our phones, whatever it might be, or to things that are within us that we think about ourselves. If you have like a thought that just ruminates over and over, being able to take a minute, and give you, cut yourself a little slack. And, and I know we have our lives, you could be caring for three children, you know, you could be running around to appointments, who knows, right? Even, and, even just taking a minute, 
30 seconds, 10 seconds to catch your breath, it could, it could be a game changer because it helps you center and ground yourself into that relaxation and just lifts the tension just a little bit. And I, met, I saw someone earlier mention something about little things building up and feeling overwhelming. In the same way, little good things build up and make a big change, right? You could flip that bat a little bit as well. Breathing also just does an incredible job with just bringing down your stress level, right? I'm not saying that a, a simple breathing exercise is going to make the stress go away. It's gonna get you from a level 10 to a level two. That's unrealistic, right? We're getting you from a level 10 to a level seven or eight so you don't flip your lid, <laughs> so you can go through the day, so you can get through the day without feeling just so weighed down. And breathing in just an incredible, I, I like to think of it as a, like a little reset button, right? Um, or an alternate path, like you're short-circuiting things to tell and trick your heart, mind, and brain to calm and bring itself down. Something really cool about our bodies is that they're incredibly adaptive, right? It could get used to doing something. Let's say there's a trigger that normally, for example, let's say for the longest time, my alarm clock was a trigger for me and would send me or my telephone, I was a crisis responder. So when my phone went off, it meant that I had to be on and ready to go to deescalate something bad, right? And so the, the telephone call was this trigger and shot my heart rate up, ready to go, adrenaline pumping. I don't have that job anymore, but the phone still does that to me. And so being able to breathe and let your body know, hey body, we don't need that response anymore. Thanks so much, but I'm good. We're in a good place. It's just a call from my mom. Now, sometimes those calls can be something else, but no, you know, it could be a call from just somebody, right? And so um, Raymond, last thing I'll bring up here, Raymond brought up something, right? Cortisol release, right? When cortisol gets released in the body, breathing can sometimes help, right? And so this is something that I heard from, if you're familiar with um, some relationship psychologists, um, they're named, the, they're the Gottmans. They're very famous if you ever want to look into them. But they, they, they talk about this idea of if you're in a fight with somebody and it's gone too far, you need to give yourself a break and the break needs to be at least 20 to 30 minutes. And then the person asks, why? Why 20 to 30 minutes? 20, 30 minutes is when is the amount of time it takes for that cortisol to roughly be metabolized by the body so you can actually feel less triggered, right? There's actually a chemical process that's going on in your body for you to feel dysregulated, out of control. So you gotta give yourself some time to let some of those chemicals release and then you can go back to what everything, um, how everything is going. So some tips for you all to be aware is not just that breathing is a break, but a breathing, it gives us time for our body to metabolize that cortisol from a very biological perspective as well. And I want to so just is, add, yeah, I'm go sorry. Ahead. I want to just add quickly as I'm thinking about, you know, um, our community, our bleeding disorders community, um, it's, important <laughs> no matter who you are whether you are someone who is diagnosed with a bleeding disorder whether you're a female your carrier you know you're a grandma taking care of your you know um, eight-year-old um, grandson who's diagnosed with hemophilia no matter who you are breathing is something you can do it's for free <laughs> it's you have control of it you can use it whether you're at your um, HTC, right? Um, getting there or getting to the infusion center, you know, getting ready to be infused. I mean, you can use this technique anywhere you are. Um, and you can, and if you're an adult and you're just starting to become aware of the importance of this, that's powerful. Um, so, you know, if, if you've practiced this too, that's great, continue to do it. <laughs> um, but also it, it, it tying it back to the analogy of the umbrella, right? Sometimes it may take, like John mentioned, you know, um, 20, 20 minutes. Sometimes we need to use 10 solutions, 
for coping, depending on who you are, what makes sense to you. Okay, so um, we wanted to definitely start with the reading um, and talk about the importance of that. But again, pay attention to what makes sense to you. And an extension, thank you so much, Sandra. And an extension of this breathing work, John um, has just put in the chat that there are nine videos dedicated to meditation and yoga. So feel free to look into that while you are experiencing this conference um, to really take, up, take home those benefits with you. And um, somebody once said back to the breathing real quickly, um, a quote, you wanna change your life, change the way you breathe. And I was like, that's pretty powerful. Okay, all right. Um, so with that, um, um, coping skills. And I just want to um, begin with that sometimes the way we cope can also increase our stress. And that is called what we call maladaptive coping skills, which so many of us do. And just to be aware of that, um, some of that might be, for example, overeating, over drinking, emotional numbing, procrastination, um, denial, avoidance. In your life, how do you cope? with stress, with anxiety. Um, and on this uh, slide are just a few examples of the coping skills, but it's also important that I'm going back to what Sandra said, and it's individual, find out what works for you. Um, we're all different. We're all so beautifully different. I cannot stress that enough. And there's so many strengths in that, which we will talk about, but, um, I also want to say that these coping skills oftentimes are not passive, they're active, they take work. And sometimes in the process of that work, they also feel uncomfortable. And that's okay if there is discomfort. Sometimes also growth is working through the discomfort. Um, the positive, these coping skills also help to take away um, and reduce the symptoms of stress and anxieties. Everything that we're talking about, like the breathing, this is something else that could help reduce and take away the symptoms um, of, the, of the stress and anxiety. The first one I wanna say is ask for help. Seek help if overwhelmed or unsafe. And as John stated at the very beginning of this, that's not always easy. That's not always easy to do, connected to culture, connected to what, how is this demonstrated? What are the thoughts, the feelings behind it? So to be able to keep in mind then is how does culture affect your coping skills? And the other thing, excuse me, my note over here is, and how easy is it for, it to, is it to do, which I said. The other one is to turn to people for emotional support and talk about your feelings. Going back to the stained glass window, going back to the slide of holding, of being connected, going back to breaking that isolation. That is, that, this is so important and yet so challenging, especially in this time of COVID. Um, so be aware of that, how to do that, whether that be a phone call, whether that be Zoom, whether that be nature, whether that be some form of connection. And then um, Sandra or John, do you want to say the next few? Yeah, the one that stands out for me. So I'm, yeah. uh, when John was saying, you know, if you're someone who has two children, I'm that person. <laughs> I have three children. And so um, the coping skill that stands out for me on this slide is structure your day, keeps you on track and connected to my world and my kids' world. So when I come home from work and they're home from school, um, it's already known in the family that I need time to breathe. <laughs> so I go to the restroom, that's my sanctuary. I do what I need to do to bring myself, my nervous system back down mm -hmm. and be more present and shift gears. So having that structure and, and laying out that foundation for, for your family and whatever your family unit looks like, um, for my family, that's, that's what makes sense to me in order for me to be able to be there for myself and for others. And the other one that stands out for me is music and art. 
Um, so coping, um, we're a very musical family um, from way back, my grandparents. <laughs> and so bringing joy into my life, especially now in my family's life is really important. Um, and some of our cultures too, taking it back to culture, right? That's instilled so much so and it's ingrained and in, in a lot of what we do day to day, if I'm cooking, I'm listening to music. If I'm cleaning, I'm listening to a different kind of music. <laughs> So whatever resonates for you, as Raymond was saying, what works for you, that's what we want to encourage you to continue to do. Um, and if you and if that's not sufficient, you know, it's OK to kind of vacillate between what works today and what may work on a different day. Raymond, how do you feel about. Um, so this is a great list. This is a great list of coping skills some of which we'll also include in an offline resource. So you all can take this home with you. Um, but for the purposes of time, I wanna give people the opportunity to speak in our Q&A. How do you feel about moving forward? Absolutely, yes, yes, right, for the purpose of time. Thank you. Um, and this is where we talk about, thank you, John, of our, our strengths and resiliency. So we just wanted to, again, gentle reminder that um, what in your life has made you stronger? So again, taking it back to the image of the umbrella with the spokes, with the torn, with the repair, all of that, okay? We are beautiful because of everything that we have gone through and continue to go through. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're reminded of that. Every individual, like Raymond said, um, you know, we have our own strengths um, and, also, it's important to understand that we also have limits. So that's a strength, right? And understanding, you know, this is as far as I can go as a mom today. <laughs> um, and I can give this much and it's okay to be vulnerable and say that, right? Um, and then collaborating, right? So sharing like what we're doing now. Thank you so much for sharing in the chat. Um, and in this conference, this annual conference, right? It's such a wonderful resource and a sense of community and a sense of belonging for, for many of us. So again, that's a big strength. Um, and we wanna also um, thank you, know, you for being present. That's a strength for us because as we've taken the time to really put this together, we're also learning from what you are sharing with us, right? Um, and then again, resiliency. Um, what in your life has not just made you stronger, but what in your life similarly has, you know, given you that resilience. Um, and we talked about um, what that may look like. There's, this is a um, definition of resilience. I'm not going to go into the details of it for purposes of time, but really it's about bouncing back from adversity. Okay, how do we do that? How, how long it takes to do that, the ability to integrate our whole selves <laughs> into life and recognizing that it looks different for everyone. All right. So we might have been a tiny bit sneaky, genius or genius, I'm not sure, one of the two, but the structure of our presentation today is actually a little roadmap for you all to use this in your own lives, right? So a reminder, the sections that we used today were self-reflection, how it works, and in my life, right? So with self-reflection, early on, we taught you how to check in and tune in to channel you, right? How are we figuring out how we feel inside? It could be a little break. It could be a breath, whatever it is. Just taking that moment to check in and see how you're doing. If you're overwhelmed, you're overwhelmed. We're not judging these feelings as they're coming up, but we need to know this is our body, right? What are your thoughts sound like? Things like that just checking in, that's that self-reflection piece, how it works, moving into that. Now you're trying to figure out, based on the things that you've learned today, just very generally, what do we think that the stressor is? What's the problem? What's happening to us? So then taking and applying some of those things that you now know, whether it's the brain that you've learned more about now, whether it's trauma itself, right? To kind of make sense of what you are experiencing right now in the moment. And if something is holding you back, right? Being aware of those things and your body function, all of these things that you've learned today and trying to apply it. 
And now lastly, in my life, we've talked about coping skills, strength, resilience, right? Figuring out how to take the ease off of some of the pressure that you might be feeling, how to connect and feel, if you're feeling isolated, right? One of those things is finding that connection wherever it might be. And it might be something small that brings that connection. You never know. And more often than not, there might be ways, whether through coping skills or other things, to self-soothe, right? To help yourself process. Those kind of things are so important. And it's important to, now you have a little bit of a roadmap. You, and some of you may already be doing this unconsciously or not even knowing it. But this just gives you a little bit more structure for how to walk through that process for yourselves. And so I, we do want to say this as well, that if this does not work and you're still feeling really poorly or your well-being is not the best at this moment when it, term, when it comes to your mental health, you can seek mental health professional support, right? As therapists, we fully support that. And, you know, we, we know it can be difficult to reach out, but I think what the advent, you know, one good thing perhaps from the pandemic, telehealth. Telehealth is an, an incredible part of mental health now. Um, in my practice, I see probably 75% of my clients telehealth, meaning video conferencing, Zoom, FaceTime, right? The access and the barriers aren't quite as there and might make you feel even safer um, as well, if, if mobility is an issue as well. So just keep in mind that roadmap that we've set out for you. Thank you, John. Now we want to invite you to enter your questions into the chat. Again, I wish we had three days. <laughs> uh, maybe in the future, um, you know, we won't be able to get to all of your questions and, and maybe, you know, acknowledge all of your comments, but we want to thank you um, for being present and for um, taking the time to, to do that. So um, please go ahead and, and put questions in the chat. And thank you all. And I'm going to give you all a big thanks in a few minutes because I do want to get to these chats. So sum it up for the sake, because I know how much you all love to have that interactive part. If you can stop sharing your screen, so this way we can all see everybody again. And then some that at the end, I'm gonna ask you to put up that last, uh, that, that last, uh, the last slide. So, you know, this session has been truly monumental. And I mean that in every sense of that word, from the imageries that you provided us to the way you explain what is actually happening in our brain and in our psyche and in our bodies, which is truly incredible. So we have one question here. We actually have a couple of questions. And the first question is, there has been a movement towards disclosure of disabilities, including mental health, you know, especially in the workplace, which has its benefits, but can also be difficult to do. So what are your thoughts on navigating the fear behind judged or worse in that process? That is such a good question. That's a great <laughs> Great, great question. Thank you. Up right up. And the first thing that comes up for me with that question is because um, in my life I've done disclosures. And one of the things that I look for is do I feel safe? I'm not mm -hmm. always going to feel completely safe, but do I feel safe enough? Do I have a foundation for this? What happens if somebody doesn't respond well? that hypothetical, will I be able to stand still and still hold that and be all right? And the other question that, and the other part of that, which I think is so important, do I have a support system? Am I going to do this? And with a support system that people are gonna be there for me. We're always gonna have naysayers, as they say. We're always gonna have somebody who's not going to respond the way that we want, et cetera. But will it be the best thing for me in the long run? Am I doing this for me? Am I doing it for them? These are the, these are, this is the way I will, um, this is the way I would approach this. And thank you. It's a great, great question. And somebody mentioned, a participant mentioned this earlier in the session in the chat as well, of this individual 
gaining a better sense of what was in his control and what was not in his control. And I think that's a really good skill to also connect to what Raymond was saying is figuring out which of those fears are being triggered by something that's within your control and mm. what things are not in your control. Um, because if they're not in control, you can let them go um, and focus on the things that you can't actively do. And that support system could honestly be one coworker that you really trust or someone at home that's willing to listen to all the craziness or all the good things that might come from a disclosure. Yeah, you know, that's so important, John, because even, you know, at, at, at you know, where I'm at, I've had my core group of folks that we would go out for coffee when stress got really bad at work or a meeting or what have you. And it's been interesting how that's changed. And luckily, you know, our system, you know, we have the Teams option. I'm actually very grateful that I actually still keep weekly meetings. Just not, they're actually not even, they're just coffee talks with my two support systems. And I am so great. I've gotten getting emotional. I'm so grateful for having them because we speak on a regular basis to have not just help us through COVID, but through everything else that's happening. So we have two more questions here that I definitely think are really important to get to. And one of them is, what's a new angle to use when confronted with something upsetting? So what's a new angle to use when confronted with something upsetting? And then we have another question after that. Right, something I, that can, go ahead, Raymond. Well, I don't know what angle you used before. So the new angle might be the old angle. I just wanted to say that. Okay, right, okay. Um, something, uh, can I when mention I, something really quickly? Yeah. If that's okay. I think we were, I'm presuming here that the three of us were like quiet for a moment because we were like, wait, what angle? Like, <laughs> I need more information. <laughs> but I'm just gonna, you know, um, talk out loud. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking like, depending on your angle, again, safety, your comfortability, um, you know, um, what makes sense to you if you're unsure, this is where we would want you to ask for support, um, whether it's a friend like John mentioned, and if you want to schedule, like, if, sometimes you don't have to be in therapy for like years. Maybe this is that one time where you're like, you know what, I want to go see a therapist and process this and learn, you know, healthy ways for myself. I want to preserve, let's say, if it's about employment and disclosing yeah your, you know, your status or your disability, whatever, however you want to describe it. You know, I think it would be really good and it would be a good way to learn strategies on how to go about doing that. Um, I also want to mention the timing um, is something that I would want you to think about. Is this the right timing for me? If I'm a mm -hmm. you know, caretaker for my family that mm -hmm. I want to go about addressing it in this angle. So those are the things that come up to mind for me. Yeah, two things that came up for me. First one being to address some of, you know, if you do want to seek out a therapist, it can be daunting, right? Um, oftentimes what I tell my clients is, you can just imagine that I am walking with you on a path, right? And I might have been on this path before and to help guide you through that a little bit. I'm not walking in front of you. I'm not walking behind you. I'm walking right next to you, right? This is a friend that's going on this hike with you or a walk with you. And to think of it a little bit more like that, instead of you're going into someone's office, a doctor or otherwise, and this person is gonna fix all your problems and they're gonna judge you. Absolutely not the case, um, but I can imagine it would still feel like that. Um, but another strategy that I thought of too, to kind of piggyback off of Sandra as well, is to approach it with curiosity. Um, just curious, like, wonder why that made me upset. I've been doing this myself recently about things that make me annoyed. Why am I annoyed? What's going on? What's going on in there that I'm feeling this annoyed at something that's happened? It takes a little bit of work because you have to take the ego out of it, just a tiny bit. But it is another strategy to kind of look at your life from a zoned out, presumed out perspective and just be curious about things. Oftentimes you'll see therapists are just very, they're experts in curiosity. They're just exploring all the different angles. And that's a good way as well, in my opinion. Great, thank you. Wow, that, that was really powerful. And thank you for giving us those opportunities to look at things a little bit differently. So here's another question actually, and you know, it's interesting 
because as I've gone seeking therapists myself for many years now, um, as a gay Latino, you know, I'm always thinking about cultural competency and then finding that right fit. So the question here is, is having a culturally competent social worker or therapist important when seeking help? Is, imp is it important when seeking someone to talk to? Um, my immediate answer is absolutely. <laughs> yes, it is. Because going back to culture and how important it is, if um, how we think, how we feel, how we behave in the very beginning of this presentation, there's two things. If you don't know my culture, if you're not competent in it, you're going to miss big pieces of me. It's, it's also what's connected to this is as therapists, why we go into history. We are our history. If you don't know my history, you're going to know, you're going to miss big pieces of me. So for me, I would say yes. And they are out there. That's the beautiful thing. There's a lot of therapists out there. And I really believe with therapy, because for me, the way I work, therapy is so relational. The healing is in the relationship. Our brain is a social, going back, I'm a brain person. Our brain is a social organ. It's social. It's, the, it's maturation is dependent upon positive interactions with others. It doesn't happen in isolation. Back to isolation. It's why we don't heal in isolation very well. We heal better with others. That's my... The, the, that's my quick answer for that. And I mentioned something really quickly too to piggyback on what Raymond mentioned is um, as someone also, you know, therapists also go to therapy. <laughs> um, we're human beings. Um, so I was exploring that option, right? I really wanted like a Latina from Mexico who was a therapist. And that didn't happen. So <laughs> um, and I was, <laughs> I was connected with an angel, uh, an angel mm. on earth. That's how I describe her. Um, and she was uh, very different from me, the way I look, my, my background, my upbringing, my culture. Um, but we connected in other levels that I needed at the time. Um, it's cultural relevancy is what I think she did have. Um, and that was enough for me. So again, I think, it, yes, to answer your question, culture is important when you're looking through to find someone to connect with in a therapeutic relationship. But also if that is not something that, for example, insurance, you know, from the list of providers that you're able to access, um, know that there are amazing people out there that you can still do wonderful work with. Right. And I just want Thank to get you back, Sandra. There's yeah. also the language of the heart, the language of the heart as well. So thank you. And John, one quick thing. Did you want to say something? I saw you unmuted. No? Yes. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay. So Samba, if you can get that last slide up, um, because as I want to first begin to, to thank you all. You know, Samba used that terminology angel. And I think what we just experienced for the past hour and a half are angels right here. You have all given us such an incredible gift to really, really just accept, you know, re reassess ourselves, that word resilience, and also moving forward. You know, I want all of our guests here today to look at these, at the contacts that Sandra, Raymond, and John are available to you to, if you have any type of questions um, as we keep moving forward together, because we are on this journey together. And as Raymond said earlier, we've never experienced anything like this, especially even the past couple of weeks. Things keep changing, things keep moving. But here at NHF, we are dedicated to your mental health that we're actually moving forward with new mental health initiatives. In the next couple of months, we're, we're gonna, we'll be doing national focus groups and doing some needs assessment. We'll be also doing this with HFA. So really excited to start this together project that we are now initiating and very grateful to have so many people on board. Even here at BDC, we also have other sessions that are including mental health. There are about 15 other sessions that included components of mental health. And as a Latino from Colombia, I am so proud to know that we have two sessions specifically in Spanish that are looking at mental health and also raising children you know, during this pandemic. 
So I want to make sure that for my brothers and sisters, my Latinos, and those of you who speak Spanish, to check those out as well. And as we mentioned, we have nine great sessions about yoga and meditation. And this is something for you all to explore. Maybe it's your first time exploring those, or maybe it's your umph time. But as John was talking about, there's different components of ways to look at the world to find a little bit more focus and peace. But we are in this together. I am grateful for your time, Sandra, Raymond, and John. And thank you all for being part of the session. Just a reminder, there will be an evaluation. So please make sure you fill out that eva evaluation. And I know you're not going to be doing it for the prize. You're going to do it because it's going to help us create better sessions next year. And next year, you know, willingly, we will be seeing each other in person. But until now, thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. Please take care of yourselves, not just physically, emotionally, and spiritually. It was a gift to be part of this session. And also thank you, Nicole, for being our uh, tech manager and Nick for being our tech manager. I would not have been able to have done this without the team that we built here for this session for you here at BDC. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful conference.